wise sincerity covers the saint's uncomeliness. It flows from the grace of the gospel covenant. The gospel covenant relaxes the rigor of the law, called for complete obedience, you know, and speaks rather in terms of sincerity and truth of heart. When God entered into the covenant with Abraham, he expressed this requirement. He said, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect or sincere. Genesis 17, 1. It is as if God had instructed Abraham, come and see what I expect of you and what you can expect of me. If you set me before you and sincerely try to please me, you can promise yourself what an almighty God can do protecting you in your obedience and forgiving you when you fall short of perfect obedience. Walk in the truth of your heart before me, and in Christ I will accept you and your sincere effort as kindly as I would have Adam if he had never sinned. John said, If our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. It is not the presence of sin in us, as the covenant now stands, which conscience can condemn us for. Paul's conscience cleared him and even afforded cause for holy glorying while he found sin stirring within himself. Conscience is set by God to judge for him in the private court of our own hearts. It is bound up by the same law by which Christ himself will acquit or condemn at the last day. When we go on trial for our lives before Christ's bar, the great question will be whether or not we have been sincere. And as he will not condemn the sincere soul, though a thousand sins be brought against it, neither can our hearts condemn us. But how can God accept such imperfect obedience when he was so strict with Adam that he pronounced one failure as unpardonable? In the covenant God made with mankind in Adam, there was no surety to guarantee and stand responsible for man's performance of his part of the covenant, which was absolute obedience. And thus God, to recover his glory and pay himself for the wrong which man's default would do to him, stood strictly with Adam. And yet in the gospel covenant there is a surety. Jesus Christ, the righteous, who stands responsible to God for all the sins of a Christian's lifetime. And the Lord Christ cancels not only the vast sums of those sins which Christians are charged with before conversion, but also all the dribbling debts which they contract afterward through weakness and carelessness. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins, First John 2, 1 and 2. And so then, without impeaching his justice, God can cross out his saints' debts for which he paid by Christ. It is mercy to saints, but justice to Christ that God should do this. What a precious oneness when mercy and justice kiss each other. Also, God required complete obedience in the first covenant because man was in a perfect state, full of power and ability to perform it. And so God expected to reap no more than what he had planted. But in the gospel covenant, God does not infuse the believer with full grace, but true grace. And accordingly, he expects not flawless, but sincere obedience. Secondly, it covers failures because of God's great love. It is the nature of love to cover infirmities, even a multitude of them. Esther broke the law by coming into Ahasuerus's presence before she was invited, but love soon created forgiveness in the heart of the king to pardon her of that transgression. He delighted in Esther's beauty, in the way God takes pleasure in his children's. Such as are upright in their way are his delight, Proverbs 11.20. God accepts the person whose heart is right with his heart, and so with infinite satisfaction at seeing a ray of his own excellency in his child, he rejoices in him and then takes his hand and 
lifts him up into the innermost chambers of love. Only rarely does Scripture speak of an upright man with merely a stark statement of that uprightness. There are usually other circumstances, like costly engravings on tombs, which reveal that no ordinary man lies there. God presented Job as a nonsuch when he described his uprightness. He said there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man. We also read of the vastness of his estate. God was pleased to point out his servant, but he did not count his earthly affluence worth telling the devil. He did not say, have you considered my servant Job that there's none so rich? No. Instead, he said, there's none so upright. God exalted Caleb to a towering place when he spoke of his uprightness. He said, but my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land. It was as if he had said, here is a man whom I own as my special servant, an unusual gem. He carries more worth inside than all the thousands of murmuring Israelites. How did Caleb come to this honor? God answers, he hath followed me fully. It was Caleb's sincerity which brought him honor from God. And after he had spied out the land of Canaan, he was strongly tempted to give a false report. Ten out of twelve men suited their answers to the discontented majority. And by making a report contrary to theirs, Caleb brought suspicion upon himself and put his life within the reach of a furious crowd. But courage, trusting God, edged out fear, and Caleb was faithful to his commission, speaking the exact words which filled his heart. And because he did, the Lord erected a memorial to him that will last as long as Scripture stands. One final example of God's loving testimony concerning sincerity was uttered by Christ when he saw Nathanael for the first time. Behold, Jesus said, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Jesus' heart, like the baby in Elizabeth's womb when Mary greeted her, Jesus' heart stirred at the coming of Nathanael to bear witness to his own grace in him. Although Nathanael was wrapped up in the common error of the day that no prophet could come out of Galilee, much less from an obscure place like Nazareth, Christ saw his honesty and did not give place in his thoughts to Nathanael's ignorance, but rather showed him divine favor. The next topic, inseparable companions of insincerity, inseparable companions of, of, excuse me, of sincerity. First, sincerity makes the soul willing. A perfect heart and a willing mind are joined together. David counseled his son Solomon to serve God with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. A false heart puts off its work as long as possible and deserves little appreciation for work done under the rod of correction. But the sincere soul is ready for responsibility. Though it may lack skill and strength, it will always be eager. Such willingness is like a hawk perched upon a man's hand. As soon as the game is in sight, she launches forward and would be in flight immediately, except for the tether holding her back. The Levites were more upright in heart to sanctify themselves than the priests, it says in Second Chronicles 29.34. Why? They were more willing to work. No sooner had the word come out of the king's mouth concerning reformation than the Levites arose and sanctified themselves. Reformation is an icy path which cowards prefer to have well beaten by others before they venture out on it. But sincerity is made of better metal. It's like a true traveler. No weather gets bad enough to stop him after he has determined to make the trip. And the upright man does not stand around looking for loopholes or or letting discouragement fester, but takes his orders from God's word. And once he has them, 
He will not be turned back by anything short of a counter-command from the same God. His heart is merged with God's will. When the Father says, Seek ye my face, the heart echoes, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Psalm 27, 8. Even when failure is the result of our best effort, willingness speaks success to God. When a father asks his small son to bring him something, an obedient child does not complain that the command is too hard, but he runs to do it. And if he uses all his strength but miscarries the simple mission, his willingness stirs up the parent's pity to help him. And thus Christ throws this covering Over his disciples' blunders, he says, The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak, Matthew 26, 41. Such childlike obedience, like dripping honey, comes without squeezing. And even though there is only a little of it, it tastes sweet to God. And then secondly, sincerity makes the soul open and free to God. The sincere person does not try to hide his infirmities from God. Even if he could, he would not. For God will uncover what the soul covers. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Verse John 1, 9. Augustus once promised to pay a, a large sum of money to anyone who could bring him the head of a famous pirate. Now, when this pirate who had heard of this offer, himself came in and laid his neck at Augustus's feet. He was not only pardoned for his past offenses, but rewarded for his confidence in Augustus's mercy. God is like that. Though he demonstrates his fiery wrath against sin and unrighteousness, he will not punish the person who comes humbly and freely to give glory to his mercy. Unlike the sincere soul, the hypocrite hides his sin as Achan concealed the wedge of gold. He broods over his lust as Rachel sat on her father's idols. It is as hard to get a hen off her nest as to persuade a hypocrite to uncover his lusts and openly confess them to God. When the average servant breaks a glass, He quickly hides it from his master by throwing away all the pieces where he thinks they will never be found. Just so, a deceived person feels relieved that he handled the problem well and put his sin out of God's sight. It is not treason itself which bothers the hypocrite, but any public knowledge of his treachery. And although it is as unfeasible to blind the eye of the Almighty as to stop the sun from shining by covering it with our hand, the hypocrite tries to do just that. But God warned against this kind of stupidity. Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord, Isaiah 29.15. There is a time coming. It's called the month they shall find her, Jeremiah 2.24, when God's cry will overtake sin, His terrors ransack the conscience and reveal what has been so stiffly denied, forcing sinners to face their deceit and shifting the burden of their sin. God never fails to unmask those disguised people who play their game so confidently by rules they invented themselves. But sincerity steers for a better course. An obedient child does not want to wait until someone else tells his father what he has done wrong, but he goes to him of his own accord and eases his aching heart by a full and free confession. His plain-heartedness makes no excuses, but gives full weight to every part and aggravating circumstance of his sin, so much so that if the devil himself should come to glean what is left, He could hardly find a remaining crumb of blackness for making his accusations. Thus, the sincere person confesses his sin in such a flow of sorrow that God, seeing his cherished child in danger of being carried down too far toward despair, 
comforts instead of scolds. Amen.